in the Christian Bible, the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 1. It's one of the most profound and powerful pieces of human wisdom I've ever heard. Judge not, lest ye be judged, for in the same manner might ye be judged. Paraphrased, of course, through translations and translations and many years of human influence, don't judge people unless you want to be judged back. Glass houses, the casting of sinless stones and all. <laughs> This episode is about how we rush to judgment and why it feels so good and why we feel so bad after. Or maybe we don't. This may not be an easy episode because it's hopefully going to encourage you to deconstruct some of your most foundational beliefs, rethink some things, overthink everything you know. Maybe admit we were wrong. Hopefully ruffle some of your feathers in a good way. In this episode, we come to some of the harsh realizations that we are the sum of all our parts, even the ones we don't like. In this one, we overthink why people act the way they do. Why are we like this? In this episode, we're going to try and solve the human mathematical equation. And since I suck at math, and in this episode, I'm going to tell you why. In the next episode, I'm going to teach you how to conquer that conundrum using cups. And welcome to the podcast. This episode is called The Human Mathematical Equation, The Sum of All Our Parts. I know that sounds sort of cliche, the sum of all our parts. But when I heard that, and it really clicked. We're just data, ones and zeros but hardly binary. Like Sudoku, if you can even figure out how to play it, or an algebraic equation. And we have the answers before us. We just have to make sure we fill everything in, but do so in the right order and don't try to skip ahead so much. The answers are in those blank spaces, the missing information. Once we figure out what to put in those spaces, everything falls into place. Figuring out people, that's just math. It's sort of like an equation, like the Bible verse I mentioned at the beginning, Matthew 7, 1. Now, look, I'm not one to be religiously preachy, but I've mentioned that the teachings of Jesus Christ have a great deal of value in my foundation. This verse in particular is crucially important, if only because it's the best one in the book to shut someone down, whether you believe in the book or not. In context and out, it's the game ender, the pile driver. Who could withstand that rubber glue retort? Judge not, lest ye be judged, for in the same manner might ye be judged. <laughs> uh, mathematically, you start at zero in this equation. You're not judging anybody, right? So you're not positive or negative. You're just you. <laughs> but then you judge. Hmm. Now, the be judged there is implied <laughs> that just by the nature of you judging someone, the rest of us will be judging your judginess. And we kind of get to without, you know, taking a hit unless we go too far with it. So you judged. You're at minus one. That's if you were just being catty. Worse, that may add up. You're in the negative. <laughs> then, for in the same manner, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> now that's multiplication on the justified judgment, right? Like, you've not judged, then you did judge, and now you're opening yourself up to the exact same scrutiny, which you ultimately can't pass, times 10. Zero minus one times 10. You're at negative 10 according to my calculator, pal. Good luck digging yourself out of that hole. All because they drive a Chevy instead of a Ford? <laughs> wow. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> the idea that this verse conveys is really simple. Mind your business unless you want everybody else in yours. And that's smart because how many of us could pass our own purity tests? This really isn't about religion. It's more like, well, look, I am me and I'm made up of all these different parts. Getting to know me means understanding some of these different parts. And some of those parts are cascaded in many different faiths and belief systems. I'm gonna break down a little bit more about perspective in upcoming episodes, so make sure you subscribe. Obviously faith or spirituality, at least, it's one layer of my perspective, at least one layer. It's one of the lenses through which I view the world, events, and people around me. 
the same is true for you, even for the atheist, that is their religious perspective, or lack thereof. Now, I do see religion and faith much differently than the average believer, I think. You know, it's a portion of my perspective, but it doesn't dominate or overrule. Except, I believe right now more than ever, we are seeing social deficiencies and characteristics that are traditionally taught at home, generationally, that are steeped in spiritualities that aren't taught in schools. Things like gratitude, patience, compassion, empathy, and perspective. Especially now, I think it's important to do some self-reflection before we speak. That may seem like a lofty goal after the last few years, but I think we get there by reflecting on the things we have said and done, objectively, pragmatically, which is difficult. One of the overarching ideas of my life is taking stock of who I am, my actions, and examining why I've made the choices that led to here, why I behaved the way I have, and, and it leads me to why we behave the way we do. And we aren't all that different, you and I. And we're talking about a few things here. But perspective is one of them. And we hear that there are two sides to every story, right? Or three. My side, your side, and the truth, like I discussed in my previous episode of Cancel Culture. You know, we're, we're quick to put people into categories. We need to. It's easier for us, right? And wrong. And we sort of take sides in our own heads when a situation arises. Remember my episode Pen Pals? We start to categorize them, label them. You know, putting them in their little boxes. Because labeling somebody is easy and a cop-out. Intellectually, it's low-hanging fruit. And when you feel somebody's wronged you, it's easy to dismiss that person, to label that person as selfish. But aren't we being selfish by not opening up ourselves to alternative perspectives? You know, just, just seeing things our way. Even for me, this is a work in progress, especially in our current socio-political climate. You know, it's just to say that I work on practicing what I preach every day, and it isn't an easy thing. And I fail a lot. But backsliding into cynicism certainly squanders someone's success. You know, that universal law of attraction, positive attracts positive, negative attracts negative, and just being so judgmental certainly comes across as negative. <laughs> we must be wary about what we put out into the world. You know, after all, in Finding Faith, we learned that regardless of religion, we're all just energy. So what I'm going to talk about in the next few episodes, these techniques for dealing with stressful events or toxic people, it really can shift your entire mentality and recalibrate the negative mindset to a positive one. First, let's discuss why we react to these stressful events or toxic people the way we do in the first place. And before I get started on this self-help journey in full disclosure, I feel the need to issue a few caveats. I'm a former radio personality. I'm a voice actor, entertainer, performer for TV, film, theater, a writer, this, or whatever this is, <laughs> a dad, a husband. My batting average at those kind of sucks, but hey, <laughs> maybe those who can't play coach. <laughs> I have multiple degrees, but none of them in psychology. So outside of answering a late night request line and talking somebody down from offing themselves, which did happen a few times and quite a bit of undergraduate credits in psychology courses. I'm not trained to diagnose or treat anyone. This whole thing, all of it I'm about to talk about, is simply the perspective of a guy, a normal person like you, trying to figure things out. And I think I'm onto something here. It begins and ends with me, you, the individual, self-reflection. And that's the spoiler I'm going to give you before we go too far. Only by knowing yourself can you know others. The path to enlightenment, to understanding other people, is to dig deep and understand yourself, your own motivations, and resolve your own traumas. So, what do you say? You want to go on a little bit of a journey with me? My childhood was difficult for me, and it resulted in, or I channeled it into, along with a dark and twisted sense of humor, a fascination with the subjects I would later come to know as the social sciences. Things like history, psychology, sociology, which ended up being my minor, and human development, which was a big part of my teaching degree. Trying to learn what makes people tick, I've ended up examining what makes me tick, and vice versa. Thanks, therapy. You know, if you do the same, you'll see it's pretty cyclical. You know, we're all connected in these little traumas that we don't consider as traumatic impact us way more than we ever give them credit for. I'm getting more into that in a moment. It's just to say that while not degreed, licensed, or certified in the mental health sciences, 
I have dedicated a great deal of my independent learning, studying quite a bit about trauma's effects on social, emotional, intellectual, academic, and even physical development. I've also learned quite a bit about how much education and learning plays into this. As far as learning goes for the purpose of education, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD or anything like that. I didn't try medications for things like that until later in life. I just want a disclaimer that I can't say I had ADD. But I clearly suffer from it and have for many years, as you can tell listening to the show. I am self-aware. I don't say it as hyperbole. It's just that going through some of these academic and learning struggles with my own children, it opened my eyes to my own struggles in childhood. Mine went largely unnoticed or unattended to. We didn't have ADD when I was a kid. It's a phrase I would use trying to be funny in the past. I didn't get it at the time, but what I was kind of reinforcing was the idea that it wasn't a real thing, enabling anyone who might have heard me who really thought that way, and gaslighting myself with this self-fulfilled confirmation bias. Now, I can say it wasn't a thing I understood. It wasn't a thing I wanted to be affected by, but it was very much a thing. Think about kids you knew 30 plus years ago, growing up. You knew these kids had learning struggles back then. They acted out, they couldn't sit still. They asked seemingly random, unrelated questions. They couldn't shut up. Now we know a little better how to address this, but back then we just got the paddle at school or the belt at home. Yeah, that systematic and normalized child abuse was real, a real thing, man. You just wait for that episode. So many parents are ill-prepared for the mental, emotional, and academic struggles just the average child faces. Now, I don't say this as an indictment on parents. I am one. I just wasn't ready to have kids, and I don't know that I know anybody who was. I say this as an indictment on parenting. Just to say that don't dismiss what you don't understand. Seek to understand. I struggled academically growing up and was never given the opportunity to understand that. Thus, I can't say that I was as prepared to deal with it when my own kids struggled. I couldn't know them because I did not yet know myself. So my academic life was filled with struggle. Not so much the smarts of it, but the structure of it, which is indicative of something on a more environmental or developmental level. Things like focus, time management, organization, those were my enemies. And academic confidence. I know. I've been all over the board here, haven't I, right? (laughs) What does any of this have to do with math or human mathematical equations? Well, since I made that term up, let me explain. What do you know about me so far? Let's examine. You know that I'm learned enough in the Christian Bible to quote scripture. You know I proclaim to be a man of spirituality, whatever the hell that even means anymore. You might be able to guess, if you listen to previous episodes, a Presbyterian and non-denominational Christian raising. You know, I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ, but I kind of pick what I want from all religions like a party buffet. You know, I'm open to self-reflections. You know that I am disciplined and educated in a few different areas. You know that as a child, I may have struggled with learning disorders or at very least trauma, environmental-induced challenges. And if you're all caught up on previous episodes, you know I've experienced some pretty tough stuff. These are all things I've told you all along the way, little context clues I've dropped, if you were paying attention. You're still not taking notes. All these little factoids are my equation. They're all factors in my equation. You see, I get really ticked off when someone assumes they know me. I'm not an easy person to figure out, and I'm guessing neither are you. And that's where all this is going. Human math is rarely as simple as basic arithmetic. Often it's trig, calculus, advanced placement, college credit level stuff, while you're in middle school, no less. Figuring me out? That requires an understanding of my background, who I am and where I come from, what inspired me, what hindered me. So do you think any one of the things I mentioned before might alter the way I perceive the world in a different way than you do? Do you think any one of those things might alter the way you perceive me? Could you understand how one of those factors might affect my decision-making? 
Really consider that, objectively, if you can. Suppose you come across someone ranting and raving like a lunatic. Could you assume they're on drugs? Or assume they're mentally deranged? Or maybe something is missing in that equation. Look, if it doesn't all add up, you can either solve for X or you can just make stuff up. And too often, we take the lazy route and succumb to the latter, the path of least intellectual resistance. Yet whatever makes us not have to think or feel any more than we have to. This is where we begin to compartmentalize, putting people in their boxes because it's easier and more convenient for us if they're there. Easier for us to dehumanize them. I talked about how my children's struggles with academics forced me to examine my own. Well, I found out that while trying to help my daughter navigate middle school, <laughs> I was pretty much teaching her workarounds and sort of shortcuts, these cheat codes, life hacks I'd learned just to get by in life. These things I had to develop because I had to. I, I wasn't addressing her issues, my issues. I was offering Band-Aids. Education and therapy helped me understand that there was a problem with these shortcuts and that there was a much better way for the kid that I was raising than the kid that I grew up being. And granted, my way forced me to learn improvisation, the art of bullshitification, and flying by the seat of my pants, valuable tools that have helped me survive. But also, faking it till I make it, which is so much more stressful than just learning how to make it so you don't have to fake it. The therapy the study of myself and deconstruction of my own traumas, combined with a lifelong academic discipline in various subjects, professional training and the study of people, it's all coalesced into uh, my own method of handling stressful people and situations. Harnessing all the things I read about human development and learned about psychology, trying to not only step back and examine a situation from another angle, but to train myself to not have to step back at all and be able to approach a situation from the broadest perspective first. This comes from years in customer service or entertainment, working with the public, not necessarily wanting to deal with people's bullshit, but having to, and then having to find manageable workarounds to keep from losing my job or my freedom. You get it. Problem solving, managing other people's unrealistic expectations. Over the years, I've worked many jobs, radio formats, industries. I've communicated with all walks of life. One of my old bosses, one of the ones I liked, he offered me some of the greatest praise I think I've received professionally or, or personally, maybe. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, Josh, you're a chameleon. I've watched you talk to millionaires in three-piece suits more expensive than your car, and then turn right around and talk to a farmer wearing nothing but overalls. And you make them both your best friends. Now, it was a sales job, sure, but I really appreciated that sentiment. It was something I was aware of maybe before that conversation. I know I was aware of it after. It, it sparked this train of thought I'm on right now. I am a chameleon. I'm an actor. I always have been. More than that, I'm a voice actor. I have to be other people all the time. My radio career, my customer service background, my sales career, my acting career, and all of what I'm doing right now, it's all just relating to the person with whom I'm talking. I don't think I'm fake or disingenuous or pandering because I can talk to people and relate to people from all walks of life. You know, there's a skill in whittling someone down to that mutual connection, being able to conversationally disarm them enough to reveal the thing we have in common. But I have so much work to do. I've struggled trying to appeal to people different than I am, believe me, especially the ones who look like me and come from where I do. For me, those can be the hardest nuts to crack. But when push comes to shove and the chips are down, Matthew 7-1 prevails. It doesn't, which is why I'm doing this episode, but it should, you know. I mean, just try not to judge people as much because you never know what somebody's dealing with or has dealt with. Ask questions. Actively listen. But sometimes the stressful and toxic people in situations don't allow that. This makes solving that equation much harder when you can't ask what those missing pieces are. The, the person behind you riding your tail in traffic, like, sure, they may just be an asshole. They may be somebody who's not paying attention. Maybe they're on their phone, but maybe. Maybe their kid fell down at a friend's house and was taken to the emergency room. Let me ask you, 
would knowing why they're acting the way they are change the way you react to their behavior? So why isn't our default response reflective of how we would react with all of the information? Why can't we see the bigger picture first? When did we lose benefit of doubt? Innocent until proven guilty. Why isn't compassion our default? We're losing our empathy. That dumbing down and numbing down of society I've been talking about? It's easy to say that the bank robbers are criminal. They are. And a terrorist if you've ever known somebody who's been held up in a bank robbery. I have. That bank robber, many things. It no way excuses the action, but that same bank robber could just be a desperate husband trying to save his wife's life because her treatments have cost him his career, home, cars, and assets. Then maybe we get to ask what kind of system allows that to even happen. The bank robber still needs to be punished. Sure, they crossed a line, but hopefully a further examination of said system might be warranted. Maybe even consideration in judgment or sentencing. At least have the conversation that there's more to it. Maybe there isn't. We'll never know if we just dismiss the criminal as scum instead of a human being with real problems that led to something we can't fathom or just don't like thinking about because maybe we know how close we are to crossing those lines if we got desperate. Maybe we know how close we are to being desperate. So don't be so quick to dismiss what you don't understand. And we aren't trained to do that, you know. Research, consider, defend. We're just trained to have opinions. And all you need to have an opinion is to get one from somewhere. Higher education teaches us to research, consider, opine, and defend. And credit our sources. And this isn't some egalitarian knock on those less educated. I wish everyone had the opportunities I've had to get an education. Just not the debt. Further examination of said system, etc., etc., ellipsis. College trains you in research, and I'm not saying you can't be self-educated, but if you're going to claim to be, you need to research research. And I'm not a snob. Look, I went to local schools, nothing Ivy League, but a good, diverse, quality education. That's all it takes. I know many smart people who don't have even that, but they've worked hard outside of that academic setting to compensate. And that discipline and training in seeing the bigger picture or differing perspectives is so vital to this process, and it will make your life so much better. When we start trying to figure people out, their motivations, their reasoning and logic, well, first, like I said earlier, you gotta figure yourself out. Look at your past actions and behaviors. I'm guessing you're gonna find some patterns and parallels if you look hard enough. Many people don't even go the step of figuring others out. It's the instant dismissiveness that the person is this or that and then move on. However, this cyclical understanding of self through others and others through self is so beneficial if you'll apply it. It's just math. You have a problem, an equation to solve, right? You only have so much information. Your job in completing that equation and finding the solution is to fill in the missing pieces. And in order to find the solution, your response, you have to complete the equation. You need the information. We've got to solve for X. Hell, maybe even plot on the Y axis. Honestly, I have no idea if that it makes any sense. I'm terrible at math, and that's a story that's perfect for this episode. I remember middle school math traumatized me so bad, it impacted how I see math even today. I've always loved solving problems. I'm a fixer. Math should be challenging. I've loved puzzles. But I've always struggled logically. Even if I came to the same answer, I never seemed to get it the way the teacher wanted me to. It really knocked my self-esteem and confidence academically. In seventh grade, I was in the low math class. At the end of the year exam, I remember I had no idea about most of it. I want to say that I just drew in a little flower on the bubble sheet. What, whatever I did made the school think I was a savant because they slapped me right from there into Algebra 1 in 8th grade. I, I had no idea about regular math. No, Algebra may as well have been advanced trigonometry. All of a sudden, my little gray box with a question mark became a letter and nobody explained why. And when I raised my hand and asked, I was the class clown, a funny guy. They thought I was joking. 
My classmates laughed, the teacher dismissed me, and I never asked another question in that class. And I struggled with math the rest of my life. You see how something so out of my control set me back, traumatized me, and caused me so much strife and tension over the years? I, I didn't do well in math and paid the price when report cards came every time, and even took remedial math in college to catch up. I chose to go to a community college rather than leaving for university straight away because I wanted to take those brush-up math courses cheaper and closer to home. Now imagine that, how different my life could have gone. I would have gone to a completely different university altogether. I didn't decide on East Tennessee State University until halfway through my second year at community college because of friends I made at community college, a place I only went to because I struggled with math. Math gives me anxiety. All because of a little box turned into a letter. Plus, I moved from that school to another town. I had three schools in eighth grade. I don't remember the third one hardly at all, but at the second, I had this really shitty math teacher. God, he was terrible. Ooh, he was mean. He was unfair. Just a terrible teacher. Like, not a good educator. Which is easy for me to say, considering I knew him for a total of 24 hours combined. I remember a little bit of his class because he had more interest in bullying me than he did in teaching me. He accused me of doing something and he assigned me a hundred sentences to write. I will raise my hand and be recognized before talking in class. Unjust. That was unfair. A friend had swiped my homework off my desk. I turned around to get it back and I got hit with sentences. Then when I attempted to explain, he got mad and doubled it to 200. Well, I wasn't going to stand for that. So I said, you may as well make it 300 because you ain't getting a single one. And so he smugly challenged my stubbornness with, we'll see tomorrow. By Friday, it was over 500. And he said, if I came to his class without him on Monday, I could go to the office. Monday morning, I went straight to the office. They sent me back to class. He allowed me to stay. But the next day, again, no sentences. And he doubled whatever it was then. And I said I was kicked out of his class until I turned him in. I was an unofficial office volunteer for about three weeks until the principal finally asked me why I was there. When I told him, I had already, of course, told my dad. So when he called my dad, huh, old daddy got my back. The word lawsuit was tossed around. Anyway, I ended up compromising with 100 sentences written on one sheet, carbon copied, and I got right back into class. Way too late to catch up. And let's just say Mr. Milam wasn't really open to recognizing me whether I raised my hand or not before we got him in trouble. He certainly didn't care about me after. All of these impressions of Mr. Milam stuck with me, despite my becoming friends with former teachers later on in adulthood when I worked at the radio station in that town, and many of them spoke very highly of him. But to me, he was just the worst. So, like this topic, you know? Like I said, sometimes they're just an asshole, right? But are they? I don't know, Mr. Milam. I never did. He was just an unfair asshole to me when I felt the world was piling it on already. You know, he's only guilty, really, of denying me compassion when it was the only thing I needed. Who knows what he was going through at the time? I just know my life really sucked right then, and I needed someone to show me compassion instead of ridicule. But that relationship and resulting drama was another trauma that stuck with me and manifested itself throughout my life. But this Josh isn't so quick to judge Mr. Milam the way the old Josh was. Maybe Mr. Milam was just a jerk face. I'm betting there's more to the story, even my own. You know, it's an easy toss away. They're this or that. But by doing so, aren't we putting them into a box, categorizing them, judging them, because it's easy and convenient. We can just shrug it off as anything, just so long as we don't have to see them as real people with real problems, because then, hopefully for most of us, then we might feel compelled to help solve the problem. Then we can't look away. Then we can't be the victims. Maybe that's why we drop a dollar to the homeless person on the street. You know, it makes them feel like they're helping. Stepping back and looking at it from a much different perspective angle, many different angles, could reveal any number of solutions to the problem. You know, thank you for helping at all, but so many don't even bother, much less actually take the time and effort to think more critically about the issue of homelessness. Some tend to fall into that drug addict or won't work or low-life criminal attitude. Street urchins, I've heard them called. 
human beings who have no home to call their own for whatever reason. Does it matter? We call them all sorts of names. Even homeless in this culture has its own stereotype. And what's brilliantly ironic is that in my own city right now, on one block you have modern upscale apartments and condos and a building named after one of the fanciest restaurants in town for decades, and an underpass in a block away you got the homeless shelter. You know, you'd be shocked to know that some of the people you interact with every single day are homeless or have been. You just aren't trained to see it. Newsflash, I've been homeless. And I used to make fun of Jewel. But I've slept in my car, granted for just a night or two here or there, but in my life I have been homeless. Childhood and adulthood, homeless. A roof over my head solely due to the grace of good friends or family at the time. Why was I homeless? Does it matter? Should it? I mean, if it doesn't matter for the guy under the bridge, why does it matter for me? For the record, I was working full time, trying to do the thing my dad told me to do, work, get ahead, save, retire. But a divorce and a nasty custody battle, along with right to work legislation and working for very corrupt, conservative Republican men left me damn near penniless and hopeless, and ultimately homeless. There were times I'd have to get out of one house. I didn't have an apartment or another place lined up yet. Moving from job to job, uh, sometimes I lived in hotels for months at a time, which is still technically homeless, but just not quite how you think of it. I wasn't paying for the hotel. My employer was. So at any moment, in a right-to-work state, my home, like my livelihood, could have been yanked out from under me with no notice, warning, preparation, or compensation. Or worse yet, when I gave up my radio career to come back to Tennessee to fight for my daughter, I just had no place to go. Crashing on couches or spare rooms, man, it's part of what kept me from coming home sooner. I had friends or family I could crash with, but none close to my kid, and that, that story is much longer and off a track than this topic. It's just to say that my story probably wouldn't have fit into your first five stereotypical thoughts on homelessness. Just the uncertainty of not knowing where you're gonna sleep and shower, not having your own place, it's traumatic and unsettling. And look, my experience is nothing like what you picture when you think of homelessness, and I barely feel like I should even qualify it because I know I'm privileged, and I wouldn't even mention it because it's really embarrassing for me to admit. Except that technically it's true. And that the truth is, that truth is far more prevalent in our society than any of us would like to admit. So maybe next time you put your groceries in your car and you look in the back seat of the car next to you and you think, God, did they live in their car or something? The answer might just be yes. Think about the first place your mind goes, the thoughts you don't admit publicly. That's what I'm talking about here. Or maybe they're just hoarders, right? Matthew 7, 1, buddy. You're still not seeing them as the traumatized humans they are. We've all had a bad day. We all hit a rut from time to time. But when push comes to chub, ultimately, don't we all deserve a little compassion? Especially from strangers, we are literally none of their business, right? So why are we so quick to judge them? Why are they so quick to judge us? After all, we are the sum of all our parts in life. Just like math, see? L look at it on a day-to-day -day level, okay? We are made up of how our day goes, aren't we? If we wake up late, it can be a catalyst for a bad day. It throws us off kilter. We spin out of control. We forget where we laid our keys, the time-saving errand we were going to run on the way to work. It doesn't happen because you don't have the thing and you don't have the time. You, you forgot the, the thing you were going to drop off back at the house because you were in such a scramble to find your keys. You know, we've all had those days. And you know what? Some of us might be honest enough to admit that we've been assholes to other people because of mistakes we've made or just events out of our control. We have, most or all of us, shat upon another person's mood because we had a bad day. Now step back and account for that. You know I'm right. There is a ripple effect to the energy we put out in the world. You know, when we're gonna be in good mood, man, we're just bopping about, smiling, greeting others. It spreads, man. They smile, they greet. But the same goes with negativity. It's just as contagious, maybe more so. When you have a bad day, it can spread like a virus and can quickly become a pandemic. Yeah. 
It's easy to say you choose how to respond. That is, of course, part of this discussion. Personal responsibility in how we respond to stimuli is essential for personal growth. If you're a jerk, own it. Move on. Not owning it, blaming others for your misfortunes or mistakes, is not only narcissism, but it's where we start to build up that plaque over our happiness. The number one killer of relationships, resentment. It's toxic and narcissistic behavior if left unchecked. And we all know someone like that, that person nobody wants to work with, the student no one wants to partner with, the family member you never really call all that much. You know, whatever it is, we know somebody like that. And if we're objective, we might be able to spot some of those toxic traits in our own behavior. Because I assure you, if you don't know someone like this, then you might be the person that someone else knows. Only by self-reflection do we eliminate that toxic response altogether. Getting into a positive mindset, that's easy. Staying in one, oh, that's difficult. And we're going to talk about that. Techniques and best practices for relaxing and calming in a storm of stress. And in my next few episodes, like The Peril of Perspective, we're going to delve into this a bit more. Our own personal responsibility for our own mindset. We're going to look more deeply into why we act the way we do, why we do the things we do. But this episode is more about how we react to others and the world around us. So your mindset, your response, your personal responsibility is key to helping you respond better to those people or events which would normally send you over the edge. In this cyclical self through others relationship, we've discussed that knowing ourselves helps us know others better. Next, we're going to look at how helping others will condition us in the ways of helping ourselves. So our goal is to ensure a positive energy ripple wherever we go, right? We're working towards that chi, that balance. We want the world around us to feel good about us being in it. And knowing we have limited control over just about everything except our reaction, let's focus on that. After all, I could do an entire separate podcast on why people are assholes to each other. And from a different perspective, the one I'm trying to encourage us to look beyond, I guess that is what this is about, right? It's basic. It all adds up. After all, it's what it's all about. Human mathematics, we are the sum of all our parts. So in the next episode, I'm going to share with you my soap philosophy on learning and how cups can help you change the way you react to negative people in your life and the negative circumstances that come at us each and every day. But first, knowing what we know about human development and the stages each individual goes through, it's a complex journey through trauma that defines us, one that begins and ends with trauma, which I'll touch on more in the next episode. It's logical to argue that coming forth from the womb into this world is traumatic. The womb, warm and soothing, muffled sound, nourishing, and then... Screaming into the light, sound cold. It's a rush of constant negative or stressful stimuli. At very least, our immediate introduction into the world is a complete 180 counter to where we just were. <laughs> That's how we begin. Shock. I mean, it could be a lot less violent, but that usually involves being surgically removed and then being hooked to machines, or at least for some time. You, you get my point. Our little bodies and brains are traumatized by the very entrance into this life. Think of it any other way. You're peacefully sleeping and you wake up in the middle of Times Square, but on an alien world where everyone is bigger, louder, and poking and prodding you. Your life begins at birth, and birth is trauma, significantly more today in the age of advanced medicine than even maybe back in the old days. And when you look at the difference in the change in children, anxiety and depression, one wonders if the days of peaceful home births versus the beeps and alarms and bells and sounds and lights of a hospital might contribute. I have no opinion either way, but it's something I'd like to see researched. I was present for my daughter's birth. It was traumatic for me, and I just stood there. Birth, coming into this world, however you do it, is traumatic. And so is death. I've seen a lot of people die for one reason or another. I've seen more people than I care to discuss. This existence to the next. One is too many. It's traumatic period, for those present, but certainly for the dying. 
Even if you die peacefully, I'm just not convinced how peacefully anyone actually dies. Internally speaking, of course, psychologically, death would be traumatic regardless. A light bulb doesn't just dim, it pops. Beginning and end, trauma. So it's no wonder we wander around this world damaged people damaging other people. If you really think about it, we're affected at entry into this world and the rest is just ping-ponging around trying to do no harm for most of us anyway. I argue that even in the most well-adjusted of us, there are these traumas in our psyche, the significance of which we aren't even aware that affect our daily lives in ways we cannot begin to imagine. We're awash, immersed in this gray area, in a beautifully complex and confusing kaleidoscope of different colors of perspective, and many of those colors are shades of trauma. We don't use this to excuse toxic behavior, we use it to understand it, and hopefully eliminate it, in ourselves as well as others. <laughs> Coming up, we're talking about how to deal with stressful people or events in your life. Those things that drive you up the wall and leave you ready to lose your cool. We're going to talk about how cups can help you overcome a lot of those stresses and make you an overall happier person. Hopefully, we've explored a little more about how to rethink about our own traumas and I'm leading up to the tricks I've learned that can help us be more forgiving of ourselves and others. Look, some things, some traumas, they just seem insurmountable. These tricks are a daily maintenance for a healthy standard. Ensuring our baseline is not only fixed on seeing the big picture first, but to see people as people, always. Then we're continuing the theme in upcoming episodes about perspective and critical thinking. That training your brain to see the bigger picture first thinking. We're talking about solutions to help you live a better life. Some of the things I've discovered along the way that have helped me as I've been deconstructing a culture of cultism. Thanks for joining me. Check out some of my other videos on YouTube. Hey, look, I've got all my original music in a playlist for you. You can follow me on TikTok. I've got my TikToks in a playlist on YouTube. All of my demos and clips and stuff from TV and movies I've been in. Like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Do all the things. If you like this series, maybe consider a donation to Cash App or Patreon or Venmo. Anywhere. I'm Josh Brandon, and I'm overthinking everything.